fight and we don't have to kill everybody in the whole wide world really just needs to chill no we don't have to fuss no 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 we don't have to fight hello welcome back to just chill with oliver george it's episode 23 now and i am very excited to be able to share this episode with anyone who wants to check it out because i had the amazing opportunity to sit down with the one and only fred penner famed children's entertainer and musician um, if you're from my generation, you watched him growing up, most likely. And if you're from my, my parents' generation, then you showed him to your kids so you could get a minute to yourself. Um, and I was so happy that he was everything I imagined he would be. He was just as calm and wise and nice as, as I remember him from the show. Um, we had a great chat, just uh, just over an hour, I think. And um, I really am happy for you guys to check that out. But before we get to that, I just want to say, if you are watching this on YouTube and you want to maybe listen to this in the car or something like that, there's an audio-only version on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and anywhere else you can find podcasts. Um, and vice versa, if you're here in this and you want to come see what the show looks like in this crazy room here, come check it out on YouTube. And as always, if you want to reach this show, it is justchillpodcasting at gmail.com. If you have a cool idea for a guest or you just want to drop me a line, I'm here. Uh, please subscribe. I always forget to ask that. Uh, notifications, whatever, but subscribe. I'm just trying to get my numbers up right now so I can reach more people with these interesting interviews that I'm doing. So uh, I would really appreciate it. And now time for the episode. Enjoy. Oh, there you go. Hello. Got to press some buttons here. That's all. Can you hear I, me all right? I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. So, so great to be chatting with you, Fred. Yeah. Thank you for connecting. Um, honestly, it's an honor. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because I've been watching you since I was a kid. Some of my earliest memories is watching Fred Penner's place right before nap time, you know, after kindergarten. <laughs> so, uh, some, and honestly, I, I've only recently in doing research for this, this episode realized what a profound impact you must have had on me because here I am coming home the other night from doing a competition at Yuck Yucks where I'm silly, uh, singing silly songs to people and then I'm hosting my own show here and it just kind of all dawned on me like, wow. <laughs> all right. Well, that sounds, uh, it sounds like there, there, there may be some influence there. Well, I mean, Fred Penner's Place, I, I also realized the other day, ran basically for the duration of my childhood. It came out in 85, the year I was born. And wrapped up in 97, effectively, right before I would have become a teenager. So, Oh, my goodness. My, my daughter was born in 85. When's your birthday? Uh, December 6th. Okay. She's a, she's a November 5th baby. So, uh, you're, so she's, she's a month Scorpio. older than you. That's right. Scorpio. Yeah. I'm a Sag well, man. Um, I, that's actually one thing I was trying to find online that I couldn't find. What was the original air date? Do you know of the very first episode of Fred Penner? Fred Penner. Oh, golly. Penner? You know, um... I know I, I don't know off the off the top. I, I think it was probably something like September of of nineteen. It was definitely eighty five, according to uh, to the websites I was looking at, but I couldn't find a specific date. Well, no, I'll uh, I'll see if I can track that down. <laughs> I, yeah, I'd be curious, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, everything I just mentioned, there's kind of just a long winded way of uh, trying to get to what were your influences growing up. And what sort of led you on a path to music? Because from what I read, you were into music at a very young age. You taught yourself how to play guitar. But the, was there any influence there from other people or musical uh, heroes of sorts? Uh, well, I was surrounded by a lot of music when I was growing up. My parents were into the, <clears throat> into the swing and classical music and opera. And uh, you know, so when, when I was born in 46, um, there was all those sounds. My parents would have parties, and and a, you know, a, a piano player would come over, and it would be it would be swing music, and and lots of singing, and lots of that energy. Um, my older brother and sister, they're nine and ten years older, respectively, and they were into the 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 fifties music, so the early boy bands and and Elvis, etc. Elvis, yeah, that's right. And and then and then in the sixties, was was my was my generation of the the boomers and the the folk scene you know so i i had a vast array of musical uh influences at that time specifically in the uh, in the children's direction the only things that i i recall on on that path were uh storytelling you know i, I had a little crystal set things that you probably have no concept of but there were they used to have these little one i remember was a little rocket 
It was about, you know, three, four inches, inches high. It looked like a little space rocket ship. Okay. And the, the, and the nose cone was the tuner. So oh. you would grab the nose cone and, and you would pull it out and it would, you know, it, it, you'd move it up and down to try and find the station. Wow. <laughs> exactly. That's pretty radical. Oh, they, they, this is old, this is old technology. So I, you know, so there were some stations that I, that I, I knew, um, particularly on a, on a Sunday, Sunday morning would have like story times. And there were a number of, uh, of, of, of classic, um, actors and singers and storytellers, you know, people like, uh, Danny Kaye and Ray Bolger and, and Burl Ives, uh, I mean, really, really wonderful, essentially folk uh, style people. But uh, but I, I remember listening to these stories and just being so engaged in in the in the spoken word and the music that went with it. So when I when I came to doing my first record back in 80, you know, in 70, 78, 79, I really wanted to put a story on it because of that influence. So I, I had written the story of Blender based on a 1930s um, children's book, and uh, and and my my thought initially was, every album I do is going to have a story. That that didn't work out. the the second The second album had uh, Julie Gerand and the Polka Dot Pony, and then after that, it uh, it it uh, it sort of drifted away to, you know, to more music. But I've always uh, appreciated that my songs could have a story component to them, like something like Poco, or uh, I, I mean, many of my stories go, go deep into, a... in, in, into story thread. Um, so those, I mean, that, that vast array of music, musical uh, variations stayed with me and, and I, I use those influences. I use them all the way through my career. And well, definitely um, your, your storytelling is, is just apparent from the second you see any of your work it's you always tend to paint a picture with every song that you sing and really mm -hmm. like it's like you said it's extremely engaging so i understand why that would be perfectly tuned for children um i did i was kind of curious though because i read that when you as you got a bit older you were actually studying psychology and economics so i was curious mm -hmm. what was sort of the the thing that propelled you into saying, you know what, no, I'm going to do music. That's going to be my, my career. And that's the trajectory shift sort of, if you will. Well, nobody in, in my career ever, ever told me that I could uh, actually make a career out of playing music. You know, even though I was, I was a pretty good guitar player. I, I didn't start playing guitar till I was 15. I had done some piano with my sister earlier on. So I had, the beginning knowledge of of chord structure and, and harmony and the rest of that uh but then uh when, when i got to to making my own music it was uh how do how do i put it um <laughs> I'm looking at a at, at at a very beautiful tree in my backyard, and it, it's distracted me. So, so repeat the question. <laughs> oh, I'm just uh, what was what caused you to shift away from possibly having a career in economics yeah, into and that. the things you were studying? Uh, as I was saying, because because nobody ever ever told me that music could be the path, and I wasn't a great student, and and I, you know, in my in my teens and early uh, or late teens, trying to figure out where where life was going to go. I had no, I had no idea because I, I wasn't skilled at anything. So I, 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 I went to university basically to fulfill my, my parents' dream of, uh, of, of having a you know, a son, who went to university because I was the first of my generation to do that. Uh, so I, I went to University of Winnipeg. Uh, still, lots of extracurricular music was part of my, part of my life, uh, but, but still not that being the career choice. And, uh, and at university, the only, uh, because I wasn't a great student, the only discipline that you could actually get a job with a BA was with economics, you know? And so I, I, I looked into that and I thought, well, you know, it's, it, it's all, it, it, it's general arts is, is really just, uh, the, you don't learn anything specific in general arts. You know, you'll gain some general knowledge sort of, of a stepping stone yeah exactly but uh 
but I, I was not going to go beyond the BA. So, uh, so economics was, was the choice because I, I could get a job with the Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation and the Canadian and the Canadian government. And I was primed to do that in the, uh, by the time I graduated uh, University of Winnipeg, had my BA ready to move that path, you know, still trying to figure out, you know, I mean, who, who knows what they're going to do in their early 20s. Of course, of course. And my, my sister, who you probably read about, who was born with Down syndrome. Yeah. She passed away. And my father, who was able to see my graduation, you know, I, so there was some, some proud, proud parenting happening there. But then he, he died a year later. So I had the two mortality checks of sister and father dying within a year of each other. That's very, That's, very that, intense. Oh, very intense. And sort of it rocked my world, obviously, and, uh, and made me do the soul searching that was necessary to figure out what path I was going to travel. Uh, economics gave me something. Uh, I had a minor in psychology and, uh, and English. So I was, I, I had some things in my, in my brain that I, that I, I, I wanted to explore, but, uh, but I thought, well, the, the one thing that has been, um, and not just encouraging, but enlightening for me in my life was the music. So I thought, well, let's, let's see where that can go. You know, I don't want to be an economist. That, that does not fit my, my brain or my body. So I, I started playing the lounges and bars and universities and wherever I could, uh, could make a couple of dollars. And, uh, and that led to working with uh, some friends in Winnipeg. And we, we uh, formed a, you know, a comedy show band called Cornstock. Actually, if you, if you ever go to... To, uh, to a YouTube, K-O-R-N-S-T-O-C-K. You'll, you'll see that, that incarnation of, of insanity. Oh, I'm definitely going to check that out. Yeah, yeah, do it. And, uh, and, and then it uh, ultimately led to, in the late, in the late 70s, my ex-wife and I, uh, she was a modern dance choreographer, and, uh, and we'd started a children's dance theater company. And yeah, I that, read about this. Yeah, it called Sundance. And that, uh, that led to creating lots of music for stage productions for families, for children. And we would bring children on stage and, and we would take them through actually the story of Blender that's on the first album. That was a stage presentation where, oh. where we, we would get a you know, dozen kids on stage and give them costumes to wear. And it would go through that, that story thread. Hmm. Uh, so, so that's where that happened. And out of that and I'm sure you read this one too, out of that particular um, stage presentation, one of the patrons approached me and asked if I had a record. And this is the, the, the late seventies I had, and I was just getting into the business and I had no idea how to begin to create a record. And, uh, and so I, I, I took that to heart and I said, well, you, well we, maybe that's a good idea. And they said they, they would basically, give me a blank check to do the record wow and th that turned into uh, about eight thousand dollars and and uh, I made the cat came back with with a batch of friends in Winnipeg and uh, I had product now and uh, and I, I sold enough records in six months to pay them back which was uh, a, a, a point of pride for me of course uh, yeah and, and once and once once you're committed to uh, to an album then that opens up a whole other channel, you know, of, of direction. And, uh, and I, I had connected with Rafi prior to doing the album. And once the record was done, I sent his company a, a, a copy. Promotional. They liked, yeah. They, yeah, yeah. They, they liked what they heard and said, uh, said, great, we'd love to do some work with you and bring you on board to, to his company. And that led to uh, a five-year relationship with, uh, with Troubadour Records, Rafi's company there, and, and lots of touring and festivals. I mean, that, that was the heyday for, for family entertainment, for working with children in the late 70s. Huh. Uh, the, the decade of the 80s, there were so many... Uh, uh, the audience members were so keen on having 
quality entertainment for their kids. So that's when, when Sharon Lawson, Bram, Raffi, and myself were on the scene, and we were touring nonstop in the 80s across the, across the country, basically satisfying the need for the, for the boomers, for that post-war generation, one of the largest demographics in history, who wanted the quality entertainment. So we were satisfying that, that call. And uh, that's where, where Fred Penner's place was spawned, you know, in 1985. And, uh, and, and it just kept rolling. You know, after well, yeah, I had seen that you had appeared on, uh, on Sharon Lois and Bram's Elephant Show prior, in the yeah. year prior. And I was going to ask if that was part of how your show sort of got picked up. Uh, no, 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 there was nothing, nothing connected there. CBC, well, possibly. But CBC had been following me. Uh, across the country because these children's festivals that were growing starting in Vancouver and, and just spreading east and uh, uh, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, Saskatoon, uh, Regina, Winnipeg, they they really got into the, the children's festival scene because there were so many uh, internationally great performers who were focusing their entertainment on on the children, on the family. But and still so making on, content yeah. that was enjoyable for the adults, at least oh, in my abs- opinion. Yeah, totally. That was that was critical from my point of view because I I saw myself. Um, I was a dad, you know, and uh, and I I wanted to make my music because my music in the seventies through acting or my my work in the seventies was was very much uh, um, adult oriented. I mean, it, you know, not not in a in not a, vulgar in a, or whatever, but not in a creepy way. But yeah, but I, I, <laughs> but I was doing. No, I'm know, a comedian. Uh, <laughs> I can I understand where you're coming from. My show is uncensored normally, and I have to kind of keep my sailor mouth under control because I'm speaking to Fred Penner here. So there you go. You be careful. Yeah, now. I don't want to cuss in front of yeah, Fred yeah, Penner. Exactly. Come on. Um, but it, it was it was really an interesting time time of life to that that opened opened that door to really any kind of music because I had come from such a, a vast array of songs, you know, that, that were the influences of my life. And so when I started writing, you know, it wasn't just three chord stuff, you know, it was all those beautiful diminished and augmented and, you know, and, uh, well, and on your show, you would often do covers of song, famous song. I remember I was watching one of your videos oh, yeah. the other night and I saw you just rocking out to dancing in the street. And exactly. <laughs> I said, no wonder parents wanted to watch this with their kids, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, th- there was an interesting sort of turn with Fred Penner's Place because I- in the beginning, um, there, there was sort of an unwritten law or rule that because it was children's entertainment, because we were uh, creating music and creating shows that would get into the child, and once they grew up, then they would start feeding the, uh, the you know the the record buying system, and uh, and so the music that we were doing and uh, and not having to pay royalties on mm. were were covers you know which because because if we'd had to pay royalties if CBC had had to pay royalties at that point it would have been prohibitive yeah of course uh, but 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 we uh, we were able to do that so I I got into oh golly those first couple of couple of years were were only covers well the majority were cover songs because I, I had lots of original music to throw in but uh but things like dancing in the street we would get into and some some jazz tunes and swing songs and yeah and it was all the, over the place yeah exactly but once once the um the music system the publishing companies realized that there was money to be made in the children's market which they had never considered before they they started you know putting putting pressure on the on the system to pay the royalties so then cbc said we we need more traditional more original songs than that like public and domain sort of stuff exactly yeah. yeah yeah pd and uh, and that uh really drove me into a much deeper level of songwriting so i would uh i mean it was interesting i would uh tell the writers and we had about a dozen writers across the country who would, would work on a number of scripts, depending, because we, we, we did, like, the first season, we did 96 episodes in, uh, in about three, three, four months. Wow. Which was massive. And, and then it, uh, it varied between 60 and 90 for the rest of the, uh, the 13 That's quite years. the upkeep. 
it's a lot of material and yeah. uh and so i would tell the writers as you when you are writing a, a script and you find a point in the script where you can't there's not the right song there's not the right pd song traditional song then just write down fred penner original two minutes and send me the script and then i would write to task and that was one of the most delightful parts of my creativity because i could look at the script and when you're i don't know if you if you're a songwriter you work in i am yeah I mean, I, I try to call myself one, yeah. <laughs> well, well, you, you can call yourself one. And, and, and as long as it's a practice and something you get into. You I had a song one. a few years ago I got on local radio. And other than well, that, I basically you. just write uh, comedy songs for when I'm doing stand-up and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But. Fabulous. Good for you. Thank you. But, 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 but getting into, into the songwriting process, when you've got a script that leads you you know, you so you know where the beginning is, you know where it gets to, and suddenly there's a stop, and the energy, you know the energy that's come to this point, and so you know what the song needs to be about, and you, and you know what's coming out of it on the other side. So um, if, if, there's a, if there's a very gentle thing that, that it's leading into, then, then you want the song to be you know, maybe moderate, semi up tempo, so that there's a balance between, you know, a, a, a nice, a nice flow, into a quieter thing, or or vice versa. If if you're coming into it with a, with, with a gentler, feel, then then you want to pick it up a bit. Yeah. You know, so it, it's always finding that that wave of musical energy, you know, in the, in the course of a show. And that's what I do on stage as well. You know, I, I'll, I'll, you get a good beginning, good end, and the middle takes care of itself as it, uh, as it flows through different, different levels of energy. Well, I had actually read that, that and I was quite impressed that some of these episodes you would write the songs the night before or even on the way to yeah. the studio. So <laughs> exactly. you must have had a background in improvisational uh, improv in general, uh, or you're just yeah. great at it. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, I, I trusted my ability, you know, by the time I got to that point, I knew that I could do that. I, I, I had written some songs, you know, that were, were, were inspired and, uh, you know, by, by some activity, by some story. And I, I knew that I had the ability to take that information and to put it into a lyric form. Usually it started with lyric and then music came out of that. That was my, my, my general process. And it uh, and it 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 just started started building and the excitement of of being able to do that, and certainly the 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 trust and the the improv business that I had learned in acting and theater classes in the seventies. You know, I, I did several years of, you know, of improv then, and then the band that I was in with, uh, do you know the name Al Simmons? Sounds familiar. Yeah, he's uh, he he was he was the leader of the band. Cornstalk that I was in, and I, a wonderful uh, new age vaudevillian, a very, very talented, interesting human being. But we, uh, his ability to to be spontaneous was so high, and I learned, I learned a massive amount from him. And then, then once I was into the Fred Penner's Place world and onto stage more, uh, playing with with a with an audience. Um, and being able to turn a corner, depending on how the audience energy was going, you know, was was really uh, critical for me, be, because that allowed me to um, to take the audience with me on the journey. If if I had you know songs one to fifteen that did not vary, well, you get the song five, and it and it just doesn't fit for whatever reason. Mm. You, got to be able to to turn that corner and throw something else in that brings the audience with you so it's you a know? really so empathetic experience for me it is and yeah and I, and I and i want it to be with the audience as well oh, i'm sure so, it is you know for them as well for, yeah no that's the that's the challenge but as a performer i i loved to play that said i i loved to play I think that was very obvious. You always had yeah. such a childlike energy about you in, in all mm. the best ways. And I think it was contagious yeah. to watch, well, you know? Thank you. In much the same way that improv is contagious. It, like you mentioned with your friend, if you see someone really being that level of carefree and you can tell that they are really 
just having fun with life. Uh, it's, yeah. it's infectious. Yeah, it's uh, it, it can be very challenging to do that, obviously. Of course, yeah. Um, but it was it was uh, it was it was a great learning time. the 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 seventies was just a, a blossoming time. I was I was I was full tilt. I was busy. I was watching the world go by. You know, as the you know the 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 post Vietnam thing was happening and. Mm. And the uh, and and the folk scene was was through the roof, and that was my foundation. And and it it was was really an amazing, vibrant time for a young man to you know, to be coming into that musical world. And I uh, I embraced it wholeheartedly for sure. I've always been very uh, envious of people that got to experience the the sixties and the seventies mm. because I think just musically speaking, as you said, it's just such a magical time to to be a part of. Yeah. But, uh, you know, alas, I was born a couple decades too late. But, um, I was actually just a sidebar. Uh, since we were talking about your, your university experience, I had posted earlier today about this interview just on my Facebook. And one of my good friends from high school named Emma, who we actually used to, I would play guitar and we would have sing-alongs after school and that type of thing in high school. And uh, she told me, she's, her family's from Winnipeg. And she told me that her grandfather was one of your professors, apparently. Um, What's her last name? Her maiden name is Swayze. Swayze. I met I met Emma Swayze. There you go. She was she was uh, one of the uh, when I went to vote a couple of years ago. Oh yeah. She was one. Uh, what, do, what do you call the uh, enumerators? Okay. Uh, you know, so I, I I I got my I went over to her counter, and you know to get my ballot, and uh, and and she introduced herself. And uh, and I was I was just thrilled to meet. Well, she her said because, her parents went to school with you apparently as well. So, uh, yeah. What was? I think her mom's name is Margaret, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But she would have had a different last name back in those days, possibly yeah, that if they weren't married. Yeah, uh, I, I seem to remember. Yes, she did say that. I'm trying to remember who that was. But uh, but her her grandfather, Dr. Swayze, was uh, was my English prof for Canadian literature. And I, did she tell you the story at all? Uh, no, it was a brief comment on Facebook, oh, but I, I said that I would okay. mention it to you because I thought it was, you know, Canada's <laughs> like that. It's such a small world. You always find these connections between people. Well, I'll tell you the story because it's really, it's of course, really quite yeah, a please. lovely, lovely story. The, her, her grandfather, Dr. Swayze, was not a very good teacher. <laughs> he, he, was, he, was a, he was a beautiful, gentle man. He, he tried his very, very best to, you know, to bring to bring his understanding of, of English to the students, but, but he, he didn't, he was, his uh, voice was just, just a little pedantic, okay. you know, and, uh, and, and uh, he, he didn't, he didn't really give you that, that excitement about all that, you know, what was, he wasn't that kind of a teacher. Okay. And, and I, you know, I, I enjoyed his classes because I enjoyed the literature, but, but then the last class of, of the year, Canadian literature, we're at the end. It's a beautiful, beautiful spring day. You know, everybody in the class is ready to get this class over with so they can get, get outside and enjoy the sunshine. And, and, uh, and he starts reading Leonard Cohen's Suzanne. Wow. Okay. You, you know, you know. My dad's song. a huge you know Leonard story. Cohen fan. Yeah. I grew okay. Up so, so, so Dr. Swayze starts reading, reading Suzanne. You know, and, and we're all we're all sitting there, you know, hands, you know, faces in our hands, listening to to this fairly dry recitation of, of Suzanne. And and we're listening to it and, and it's it gets about halfway through and suddenly there's silence. And we thought, what what's going on? You know, because nobody's been looking at it, everybody's been sort of looking out <laughs> the window and letting the sound come in. And then everybody looked up. And Dr. Swayze was crying. The tears were just just oh, wow. flowing. And it was, what, what is this? <laughs> and then he he um, he he passed he passed the book over to to one of the students, says, would you finish reading this for me? And uh, and she finished reading it. And then at the end, after she'd finished, his final words, and you know, and, and it could be it could be verbatim. He said, I, want, I, I apologize to you for any shortcomings I have 
as a teacher, as I accept your shortcomings as students wow. and, and just realize the value in life that you get from, from literature. Wow. That was it. You know, it's pretty just, profound. Just, just be, and it was, it was beautiful. It was, it, it took all of, all of that stuff, all of that wonderful Canadian literature that we went through and the poetry and the, and the prose and it all, it put it all in this beautiful little, little ball and saying, take this into your life and, you know, and, and, and realize how valuable that truly is in your world. And wow. What a, Swayze. That's quite right a special on. memory. It was great. You know, and so I told Emma that and it was, it was really, I, I felt, um, well, excited that I was able to share that with her. Oh, and now she's got video evidence <laughs> once this goes up. <laughs> Great. And it was, it was very, very sweet. Um, okay, well, uh, getting back to your show, which ran for so long, I found an interesting thing that I didn't know. I knew that your show had been brought on to replace uh, the Friendly Giant. Just for right. whatever, they switched up their management and people called some shots. Yeah. Um, but I read that people were, some people were actually very harsh in calling your show the Giant Killer. Yeah, I think the media jumped on that a little bit. I couldn't believe that. I, I was wondering if you ever had anybody send you any kind of hate mail about it or something. But <laughs> No, I, I mean, they, there were a few few comments that, uh, that I'm sure CBC received along the way. And Well, they had a good run anyways. <laughs> well, exactly. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So I, I, the other night I was watching probably one of my favorite episodes where you had the crossover episode with uh, Mr. Dress Up. Which yes. is, you know, everybody loves crossover episodes, whether it's Flintstones and the Jetsons or whatever it may be. You bet. Yeah. Um, but it made me remember just how great the show is and just how awesome your outfits were. And <laughs> so I wanted to know, when it came to your, your Wicked sweaters, were they yours? Were they wardrobe? Or, and more importantly, do you still have any or many of them? Well, a couple answers. Uh, the majority were mine. I, okay. I had a seamstress in Winnipeg who, uh, who, who created uh, many of the, of the shirts. Um, and, and some were store-bought, you know, if they, if they, if they had a look and, and, and feel. Uh, and I do have uh, many of them. And so with, cool. this, with this COVID world going down and, uh, and wanting to purge stuff, I'm hopefully in the next, within the next number of months, you know, things, things open up a bit. I got a little I'm space gonna, over here on the wall, Fred. There, there it is. Yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going uh, to try and try and put things online, find some way of doing that and, uh, and, and then sell them or auction them For charity, and with, pro yeah. with proceeds going to uh, possibly the Down Syndrome Society. Perfect. Uh, you know, so that, that would, that would fit, but yes, I do have many shirts left and, uh, and someday you may be, <laughs> you may have, have a space. Well, wow. there's not much space on that wall. You're going to have oh, to there's a whole down some here. of those other things. Okay. We actually normally always ask a guest when they come in studio to bring something to put on the wall, even if they just mm -hmm. doodle something on a piece of paper. I like yeah. the idea of adding every guest that comes on sort of adds to the atmosphere, if you will. Sure. You know? um, but well, please uh, send it for charity is much, <laughs> much better. I, I, I don't need to be spoiled like that. I could send you a... a, a a now defunct poster of my 40th anniversary cat game back. Fred, you could send me a napkin with a smiley face <laughs> drawn on it and I would be over the moon. So, okay. you know, any, anything would be amazing. Um, one thing I wanted to know is what is it like, what kind of an impact has it had on you watching people from my generation grow up and now share everything that they grew up with your show with their children and seeing that passed down uh, to a brand new generation? Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, I uh, I had no anticipation of this being the path when I was when I was younger. You know, uh, and you never know. I don't think any performer knows exactly how how things are going to unfold. That's true. Um, and and for me, it was coming into this with a really strong foundation. Again, because of of Susie, my my sister, and the influences that she had on me. You know, the, the depth that she got into music and how, as a young teenager, I saw that happening and, and basically understanding the philosophy that 
never underestimate your ability to make a difference in the life of a child. That I, you know, I've said thousands of times, I'm sure. But understanding that and bringing that, that energy to a stage, knowing that what I'm doing up on that stage can make a difference, has the ability to make both a positive or negative difference if you're not paying attention That's to, to, the, to the child. So putting that out was my, was my, 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 the essence of my work. And then as people watched what I was doing and, and appreciated that part of the philosophy and liked my voice and liked the songs and just, just kept, kept feeding me basically until, until they reached their adulthood and started having their own kids and wanting their kids to connect with what they had that made, that had influence on them. So it, it became a, a, a self fulfilling prophecy in a way, you know, that, that, that the audience kept carrying me along with them. And, uh, I mean, I'm, because I never knew that that's where it would ultimately go. And I never, um, expected it to go that far where it went is none of my business. That's a fair uh, point. Know, <laughs> oddly enough, uh, it and it, 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 I I continue to do what feels feels right and and positive and strong for me as a as a person as a creator, um, and if that pa is is passed on to another generation to another human being, then that's that's on you. You know, I I'm doing my best. And, and if you carry it along, well, thank you. You know, that's all I can do. Well, I hope people keep carrying it on. I know uh, <laughs> I, I sort of came to the realization the other day that I had never shown my children uh, any of your stuff and I put it on and sure enough, they were all locked in. And that's, you know, an 11 and a nine year old too, who arguably it's, it's maybe a little bit young for them, but they still were right there and then they looked peaceful and calm. And even myself, to, like I deal with a, a yeah. decent amount of anxiety and I have obsessive compulsive disorder and some things yeah. like that, that are at times, a tr you know, troubling to deal with. Um, yeah. And I started watching your old episodes and, and I was thinking to myself, why have I not been watching these as an adult? <laughs> because it still had that calming energy that you just seem to encompass. And I'm mm. not really sure how oh, you sweet. do it so well, but, but you definitely have a really calming energy about you. Well, the, the, um, yeah, I mean, people often, often say if I'm, if I'm shopping and, uh, and, and uh, I'm, they, they hear my voice and they will turn around and say, I knew it was you before I even saw you. That's because, amazing. Because, because of the, of the calmness of your voice and who knows where, where that came from. I mean, I have a timber, uh, I have a, I have a, a gentleness that I, I like to bring to myself. You know, I, I like to find, find that calm and, uh, and positivity in, inside of me. And, um, uh, I mean, it's 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 pretty cool how people react to to my to my being. Um, yeah, because you're just being you in your mind, right? You're just being yourself. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. And and it's it's I've I've always tried to be, you know. I, I'm sure it goes back to my you know family of origin, and and wanting to be the good the good son, you know, and living up to my parents' expectations and and. Uh, you know, so I, I worked hard at being a good boy and, um, and maybe part of that was, you know, not, not, not yelling, not screaming, being calm, finding some of that. I, I mean, I, I do have my moments, but they're, but I, everyone, I, everyone does, <laughs> but the but, world needs more calm uh, right now. That's for sure. Oh, ain't that the truth? But one of the things that happened with Fred Penner's place and, um, and and I th I think because I I do not I do my very best not to condescend when I when I am on on stage or in front of a camera, you know basically what I what I do with the audience is essentially what we are doing together. You know it'll have more focus, and it'll be hey come on along Oliver I want to show you something yeah. over here. No it's not much fun. A lesson to yeah. learn or what do you think What do you think of this thing? Yeah, you know, and, and it's so your 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 curiosity is spiked. You're looking at this. I'm I'm curious, so I bring things forward, and we and we can discover together something, right? Uh, 
and the not trick necessarily, but one of the conventions perhaps of doing television, especially for for a younger audience. But I, I but I think you know any any show that that is working, or any performer that is working directly with. Um, with a camera, you know, so that, that you, the fourth wall is broken. It, for me, it was when I when I'm looking at the camera as I'm looking at the camera right now. There's one child. It's not going to thousands. I don't imagine when I was after I crawled through the log, I did not imagine that there's a sea of people out there from coast to coast to coast in Canada who are all watching me at the same time. Oh, you know, <laughs> that that could get pretty daunting. That's exactly what I would have done. <laughs> yeah, but 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 if you and and this is this is a life lesson. If you if you bring it down to the one child, then it changes everything. Then then you don't have to you don't have to rush to to get to try and get everybody's attention. You know, you think somebody's getting lost, so you have to you know, bring them in right away. It uh, it's a foible that a lot of television has right now. Thinking, and I, I just don't agree with that. That that you need to have a hit every like fifteen seconds to maintain and appeal to every person on the yeah, planet. And, yeah, and I and 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 for kids, they don't need they don't need to be, you know, a, a new path of every 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 turn. All they need to de- need is to feel that the person on the screen is paying attention to them. Mm-hmm. Especially you know? if they if they aren't getting a lot of that in their regular life with their parents, perhaps you know they yeah. might need that even more than the next child. Yeah, and and often you know adults now have come come back to me and, and said you know I I have both men and women uh, that they had had really unpleasant childhood childhoods and uh and that the watching my program was a was a uh, i i became a surrogate father yeah i think you were a, a beacon of hope and, and direction for a lot of kids yeah. that might have been going through their own difficulties yeah yeah that that when i started hearing about that 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 made a, a, a an impact on me it was okay. That's 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 a different direction. That that's not just enjoying something and feeling good about it, but that's taking it another another level. Again, that's none of my business, but but for for uh, one of the viewers to go that deeply and to recognize, you know, as they as they you know get through their teens, that this program had that level of influence is very very powerful. And I'm so I I mean honored is an understatement to be in a position that allowed me to to do that for another human being is pretty powerful it's amazing um and i actually it's very interesting to me that you said the one-on-one connection being so important because i've found basically the same thing i've only been doing this show for about nine months but all of the anxiety I get when I go and perform on stage somewhere, I still enjoy it in a, in a way, but it comes with a lot of uh, anticipatory anxiety for me. And wh- I can do something like this with someone who I just totally love from my childhood and not any nervousness. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> a weird time to get something caught in my throat. But, <laughs> um, but no, honestly, I just the idea of being able to sit down with someone, even digitally, and really connect on a human level has been just it feels so natural. It, it's not scary, you know. It, it's beautiful. It, I love learning things. I love finding out things uh, that I would not have known otherwise, based on different people's backgrounds and experiences. And it's, I bet, it's, yeah, a really great experience. So I want to thank you again for uh, for taking the time. Yeah, um, so I had a couple, a couple more really quick questions here. One was I saw a picture of you and Mr. T from the '80s, and <laughs> it it made me think. I wanted to ask you in your career. What was an unexpected encounter with somebody of, you know, fame or whatever you want to call it that you did not expect and yet you ended up crossing paths? So like, what was your favorite experience like that? <laughs> well, the first one that pops into mind was Elton John. Oh, wow. Yeah. In uh, 1990-ish, uh, we had produced uh, the, the Happy Feet album. Yeah, I heard about that you one. Be, a, a, a great, great, great album. You know, again... A uh, an homage to that swing music that my my parents introduced to me, 
And uh, so we, we had done the, the Happy Feet album and uh, uh, we had some connections in New York so we we decided to do the official launch at the Canadian Embassy in New York, and uh, th actually there were a couple of connections that happened there that were, were very very cool. One of the songs that I put on the album was called "You Can Count on Me," and it was written by um, Sammy Khan. Okay, I think it's C A H N, and Sammy Khan was one of the uh, most prolific uh, American songbook songwriters ever. I, I, I mean, look up Sammy Kahn. Yeah, I'm going to be looking up a lot of this afterwards. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Sammy was just a, a wonderful, wonderful man. And, uh, and he had written this song, You Can Count on Me. His, his uh, publisher had grandchildren who were watching Fred Penner's Place because the show was airing in the States for you know, for a few years around that time, right? Yeah, on Nickelodeon, right? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and so the, the, the publisher saw, saw me and thought, hey, I like this guy's voice. I like his style. I think he would be a, a good person to sing this You Can Count On Me song, which nobody had recorded yet. Hmm. And I don't believe anybody has since. Anyway, so he, he approached me and gave me the song. So I put the song on the album. So Sammy came down to the embassy to uh, you know, to see the presentation, and uh, and I had a photo op with him, which was 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 a highlight for me because I I I knew I knew of him and never thought that I would ever ever meet that man. So that that was a highlight, and uh, and uh, the pub the PR company that we had in uh, at that time was the same company that was working with Elton John, and Elton was uh, was doing couple of shows at Madison Square Gardens and, uh, and so the publicist said uh, well c come on down to the show and maybe we can work something out you know we can get a photo op with Elton and uh and so so we went there and there, I mean it was jammed right two sold out shows at Madison Square and uh and they had the green room was set up as like a, a 50s uh soda jerk kind of thing you know so so the the uh the 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 servers were wearing these little you know little really? little hats and uh you know and, and they were dressed in 50s costume and and going around uh, giving you milkshakes and you know that wow. kind of stuff Quite and elaborate. It, was a, it was it was great you know he, he, could, afford John, he yeah. could afford it exactly yeah <laughs> so so this room was jammed with people and i'm sort of in the middle watching all this stuff go down and suddenly the, the publicist weaves her way through. She touches my shoulder and says, follow me now. So I turned around, bzz, you know, we work our way out, go into the hallway, go into the dressing rooms and, uh, and Elton, go to Elton's room. And there is, uh, there's two kids, one of the promoter's children who are, are in the room, you know, meeting, meeting Elton. And I'm standing out there, it's Elton John. It's, it's, it's Elton, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm out there, and uh, and and then uh, after he after the kids leave, it's not far from from showtime, so he's on his way out, and he comes out, and the publicist says, you know, hi, I'm, I'm so and so from PR company. This is Fred Penner, entertainer from from Canada. Can we do a quick photo op? Fine, <laughs> and so. So I'm standing, and, and Elton is is about you know five five ten or so, and I'm I'm six six one, and so we, we're we're setting up the picture, and and he's he's got his arm around me, wait, waiting for the picture. The smile is happening, and just before he the picture goes, he takes my 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 little fat roll, and he goes beep beep, <laughs> on my, you know, oh, man. so so I've got to. Oh, that's amazing. I need to see this photograph now. Is that online or? Uh, it, it might be. I'll, I'll uh, let you see if, if I If not, you need to put that online because I'll, I'll, in conjunction it, with that it, story, that's just hilarious. It, it has been. I'll, I'll track it down and send it to you. But uh, yeah. How many people I, can say they got pinched by Elton John? Yes. Yes, exactly. Anyway, that, that was uh, an unexpected and uh, definitely unexpected. Yeah. And very, uh, very interesting connection. That was a fantastic that. answer. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, because as we spoke of, I think a lot of people from my generation and beyond come to you for your calming energy, your wisdom, your sage advice. 
and your direction. And I mm. thought, what better time to get some of that than right now while everybody's yeah. freaking out in the pandemic. So I was wondering if we could get a little piece of Fred Penner advice for people who might be losing their minds a little bit right now. Not to put you two on the spot. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's good. I mean, I, all I can do is, is take it down to what, where I'm at. Yeah, what are what you I'm doing feeling. to stay sane, you know? Yeah, I mean, things, things have, my, my life has, well, truly taken a 180 because I was in the middle of the Cat Came Back tour. I know, we tried to get you back in February when you came to Ottawa. Oh, right. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah, that was, that was a crazy, crazy time. Oh, yeah, I know you were storm crazy busy. No, no but there was a feelings. storm. And we, all, we almost didn't make it because the storm, the storm had closed things down and we had to shift flower. That was, that was a very, uh, very wacky time. But, um, um, but now life is totally different. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, the 180 is, is, it got us up to Edmonton. We were two hours away from doing uh, at the Winspear Theater in Edmonton, beautiful, one of the finest, most gorgeous theaters on the planet. And two hours before the show, the you know the uh, the local health authority said, "Sorry, we can't do it." So we scrambled. We had to uh, tear down the tear down the show. And then the next day, my side men uh, flew back to Winnipeg, and uh, and in the last year, excuse me, my wife and I have bought a property on Vancouver Island. Oh, okay. In fact, in fact, this is this is what my backyard looks like. Oh wow, a little slice of heaven. Yeah, that's it. So we, uh, so we got to, uh, I, I got back to the island and, and, uh, and so my wife and I have, have been here for the last five, five plus months, um, reconnecting in a way we've never had before. This is the longest stretch of time that I've ever not been on the road for 45 years. So it's kind you of know, a great so, thing in some ways, oh, silver lining. It's, it's a fabulous thing because now uh, the, so time now is is all about getting up in the day feeling a calm feeling the you know breathing and taking in the energy and and finding things to do in the course of a day that are self fulfilling so whether it whether it's playing guitar for a bit or or going for a hike or, or just sitting on my porch and you know and and breathing and feeling feeling the energy that's around you. I, I think, and, and one of the first words, you know, as we began this in, in March uh, was opportunity. Is this really is as hard as it may be and as challenging as, as things will feel as, as people are trying to figure out how they're going to survive financially in the, mm -hmm. you know, the SIR business and filling out the forms, all that, but taking the time to, realize this is an opportunity to turn things around for yourself and 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 really look at the wants and needs of your life uh, more more than more the needs than the wants because we are uh, are such a consuming society and you know you're always trying to get get the new whatever and a bigger tv and the rest and all of that stupidity mm -hmm. which uh which none of which people... brings real happiness in the end no exactly and it and because so many people do that on uh on credit and then the credit system goes into i mean they, they, this is a whole other other rick mercer rant <laughs> on uh on the the truly abusive system of, of of credit that that this that this this planet that this country is in you know where, where, where the they have the gall to charge you 20 percent plus on your purchases if you don't pay them off right away yeah. so they're, they're they're making they're making all their all their profits are on the backs of the of society the rich get richer yeah you know, well exactly and it's 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 wrong it's absolutely uh abusively wrong the way they do that well but, and it's, uh, it's nuts that that's still how things are in 2020 when we have all the uh, knowledge to tell us that that's not a great thing for for humanity you know we, we it seems yeah. like we know everything that we should be doing but not that many people are doing it <laughs> oh so here's the opportunity to figure out what what you perhaps should i i try and avoid the should of anything mm -hmm. But uh, but but take take the time to to really go in, find your bliss. Look at the things that that uh, that 
that you want to come out of this with? What skills that you could be learning? Even if it's just trying to be more time. active, you know, enjoying nature. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that's that's a core. Try, try certainly trying to be active, eating well. Don't don't take this as an opportunity to stuff your face with all the crap that you. Well, I know a lot of people were uh, were guilty of drinking a lot too much when it first blew up. Probably myself yeah. included at the very beginning, because everyone, especially with children in school, it was quite the the momentous shift to all of a sudden oh have goodness. your kids home and you're playing teacher to them, and it uh, yeah. you know. But the last I, couple months, I've been getting very healthy and we're exercising every day and, you know, trying to stay on top of it. Yeah, I've lost uh, probably 20 pounds in the last uh, in the last six months. So I'm I'm down. I'm down to about 180 now. And I used to be over 200. That's awesome. So so health. health we, we want you around as long great. as possible, friend. Well, exactly. And so and, and so do my kids. So of course. You know, even though they're they're back in Winnipeg and I'm I'm missing them terribly because I haven't seen them for six months. Mm. Uh, I'm hoping a couple of my daughters can, uh, they're, they're planning on making a little road trip out here in September. I hope that happens. But th- th- I mean, that's the hard, the hard part of it. But, but the, the bottom line really is you got to take good care of, take good care of yourself. You got to take good care of each other. The last song from Fred Penner's place is, is more relevant now than it's ever been. That's so true. Take good care of each other. That's what friends like to do. So you know, I'm I'm doing that to the to the best of my ability. I'm encouraging people to to do the same thing. Eat well, exercise, find the things that that really make you feel more connected to yourself and your family. And be well, and trying to uh, stronger, express you know? gratitude for the things that you already yeah, have. Well, and and I've been trying to be more in the present moment as much as possible, which I've always yeah. found is something I struggle with. I'm usually I have a song about this that I haven't quite finished, but you know, I'm always worried about the future or stressing about the past. Why can't I be sure. living in the now is, is sort of something yeah. that is an internal struggle of, of mine. But, um, but that's, that's good advice. And I think everybody should be trying to prioritize those things in their life right do, now. Do you I mean, meditate? Uh, I, I try. <laughs> yeah. do, I, do, do I wouldn't consider myself great at it, but I definitely try to, to do heavy breathing when I can and, and yeah. just sort of let everything out for a couple you, minutes. Do you have you know? an app, a, a timer app that you go to or? I haven't, no. Uh, I usually, it's when I'm, usually when I'm trying to fall asleep, really, I'll just try and do yeah. some deep breathing and, and clear my mind out. Yeah, because my, my wife is is very much a meditator and I've learned so much from her about about that. And she'll she'll do, uh, you know, a, a, every every morning, <laughs> she goes out for, for for at least a half an hour, sometimes 45 minutes or an hour. And she has done, uh, it's called Vipassana retreats. It's okay. a form of a form of meditation where where you go to a retreat uh, where it's a ten day. Oh, and they don't retreat. speak at all. Yeah, I had a friend uh, visit one of these. Yeah, yeah. and she uh, and and it's it's uh, the I mean you're the hours and hours that you are meditating in the course of a day and what that does for you. So she'll get up every morning and and she will do that and then she'll. She'll write or, uh, or or go another direction. My my wife is a uh, a, a theater uh, a, a vocal coach. A um, she works with actors, uh, helping them learn to become better actors. She works with accents. Sure. If somebody needs a certain accent for a part, she'll she'll do that. Anyway, she's a really fascinating person, and and I just learned so much about about the meditation and about there, there's a there's a little app. There's many of them. You set it to 10 minutes, you press, press the button, you hear the three bongs, and usually in the morning, at, at night you're already fading out, but to start a day with, uh, with a bit of a meditation is, is a great, and whatever it is, it's just, it's just focusing on your breathing, let that come inside, let your thoughts go wherever they're gonna go, don't deny any of the thoughts, but let them flow through you, you know, don't, don't let them rattle you, but uh, acknowledge what thoughts are happening and this is definitely from from ray ray ellen is my wife but when, when a thought comes to you it's oh that's what that is that's painful that's positive that's angering <sighs> let it go through go back to your breath go back to your breath and it 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 just gives you a a a, a balance to start what may be a very busy day with well, I've heard that, that a lot of people that meditate in the morning say that they get into a flow state that sort of follows them throughout the rest yeah. of the day. Yeah, and, and, oh. it, and it, it doesn't have to be 
uh, doing some some is better than none. Yeah, you know, and and it and it just gives you a gives you a bit of a calm to uh, to allow you to perceive things when when you're saying in in the moment. Um, that's that's the idea is is to to be as present to yourself and to the people around you as possible. Well, we, I'm going to download that app then. <laughs> when uh, when when my uh, Rail is my is my my second wife, and we went uh, for our honeymoon to a Joshua Tree. Oh wow! In California, and it was it was fabulous. We just had a great great time. But we were driving through the desert and came upon a or we're driving to a, a meditation site and we went in there was, there was nobody around ex, you know, except the, uh, cause it was really hot and new session had begun when they went into the kitchen to uh, just have a, have a visit with the person looked up at the clock and the, <laughs> the clock on the wall had no hands on it. And just the word now. Wow. <laughs> that speaks volumes. So, well, it does that. Eh? Yeah. So, so yeah. So I gotta get me one of those to be that now. Just wait, what time is it? It's now. That's good advice. I mean, to be fair, that's kind of why I stopped wearing a watch ages ago because I felt very bound by the idea of a wristwatch. Sure. So, sure. I, you know, with anxiety, especially, I was always checking if I was on time, which is it's good to be punctual, but it can be a bit of a nightmare nightmare for someone like me. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to take too much of your time. I'm already so happy you've been speaking to me for this long. We do have a question that we ask everybody. Uh, we're gonna have a new one next season, but this season the question has been: If you could have any superhuman power endowed upon you, what would it be and why? <laughs> and we and we don't allow flying because it seems like kind of an obvious go-to. Everybody wants to fly, you know. Yeah, I've I have flown, I have flown many times. What was some of my dreams? I have, I have uh, experienced incredible flight in my dreams. So I I've already flown. Um, <laughs> it's anyway my 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 superpower which actually exists is my ability to nap <laughs> so 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 this so the joke in the family is i am nap man because <laughs> you can just conk me, out you know, like that i can i can you know it, it, you, you you give me you give me some time i can go into into very deep nap state you know, for and and then get up 15 minutes later and be completely rejuvenated. Wow, that's a good so, skill to have. So, so that that's and it's always been there. So I, there you go. So Maybe I, you don't need I, a new superpower. Then that's you're right. I don't, I don't. I don't need a new one. You know, I, 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 my, my biggest challenge always is is as we just said, paying attention, being present, listening. Oh, there it is. That's the superpower for everybody is listen to the people who are talking to you and respond when it's time for you know to respond don't don't interrupt listen take in then respond that's something are. i sorry i'm clearly interrupting you now but um no no i'm done that's uh something that i've struggled with myself because uh at, through doing this show i feel like i've, I've sort of honed that a lot more because it, it's not to be rude it's that i get genuinely so excited to speak to someone and exactly. you know you get it's on the tip of your tongue. You just can't wait to get it out. But I've learned that there's yeah. a time and just be patient and yeah. you know, your time to talk will come, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm very much like that too. I'll, I'll get into it. If a conversation is flowing and animated and the other person says something that sparks a thought, oh yeah, that reminds me of this thing, you know, and, and you can't wait to get it out. Wait well, sometimes you're out. legitimately afraid you're going to forget it. So, you know, there's... Well, yes, true. <laughs> So, so always have a, have a pen pad. Yeah, true. Beside Good you advice. So you can scrawl that down. But uh, yeah, there it is. Um, okay. Well, I mean, uh, I'll let you go at this point. I, the only other thing I was actually kind of curious, just a quick answer, is I was always wondering where you filmed the intro to your show. Was it somewhere? It looks like Georgian Bay or something like that, but it's... Uh, it, yeah, it had the, the pre-Cambrian Shield feel to it. Yeah. Uh, we, we, because the series started in Winnipeg, and uh, it was Winnipeg and Vancouver. We uh, we did sort of split episodes between the two. Hmm. And uh, because w when the series began in, in 85, Halifax, Winnipeg and Vancouver were all CBC plants that were looking for uh, production that, that could come in. Okay. So uh, so we figured Winnipeg and Vancouver would make more sense than, than Halifax. All the way in the East so, Coast. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
so uh, so we did we split the shows and and initially we moved the set from Winnipeg reconstructed in 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 uh, in Vancouver um, uh, but but the why I, I keep I keep kiboshing myself here oh that's okay no the yeah. intro is what I was curious because I know the I figured the studio set with the log that was another thing but I meant when you're actually out hiking in the intro along the cliff sides and all that yeah, we had, I think there were probably three or four different intros. That's true, and, yeah, and, it did change and, 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 and ultimately it was uh, Seven Sisters Falls, which is a, a hydro plant near Pinawa, Manitoba. We did some around there. We did lots in Lake, Lake Winnipeg, uh, around Grand Beach. And then there, there, it morphed into uh, uh, the Pacific Ocean, they were running down the Spanish banks. Hmm. And, and the Pacific Ocean. So the, the one you may remember was me running along a shoreline, seeing a frog. Yeah. You know, the frog jumps and I jump and then running on the rock. And then suddenly I'm, I'm going to an, a, a, a huge lake. That's Lake Winnipeg. So it goes from Pacific Ocean to Lake Winnipeg. Now, those wow. are the two, two main, main things to give a bit of both parts of the world. That's super cool to know. Anyway. Um, yeah. Thank you so thank you. much, Fred, for taking the time to chat with me. And if you're ever in town, you're more than welcome to stop by in Great. person. Um, we usually do a little high five at the end, so we'll do a digital one. There we I, are. I can't Great. thank you enough again, and uh, all the best to you in the future endeavors. My pleasure. It was good speaking with you. You, uh, you didn't interrupt at all. You were a good, a good interviewer. Thank you, Fred. And I hope I was a good interviewee. Oh, it means more and, to me uh, than you could ever know. And, and, we did uh, it. and uh, yeah, the, the best to you and your family. Thank you so much, Fred. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.